my dearly beloved in Christ, as I announced at the beginning of Mass, this is a Mass in honor of St. Lawrence. Now, there are not very many saints whose feast days rank high enough to take precedence over the Sunday. And of course, there have been many martyrs in the history of the church, so one is tempted to wonder why does St. Lawrence receive this high rank of what we call a double of the first class feast, same rank as, as the majority of the apostles. Well, one of the reasons is he is very beloved in Rome, so much so that there are four churches in Rome dedicated to St. Lawrence. And why did St. Lawrence receive such veneration in Rome that then spread throughout the world? For a couple of reasons. First of all, he was martyred in the year 258, and the story is told that he was a deacon, and he was in charge of the distribution of alms to the poor. And so this is something that the Roman prefect, before whom he was brought and accused of being a Christian, wanted to get his hands on. And so the prefect said, deliver to me the treasures of the church. And St. Lawrence said, well, if you give me three days, I will bring here the treasures of the church. And so the prefect thought, great, willingly, you have three days, but you better be here in three days with the treasures of the church. So St. Lawrence used those three days to distribute all of the alms that had been given for the poor to distribute, distribute them to the poor. And then on the third day, he came again before the prefect and he gathered a large group of poor people. And he said, these are the treasures of the church. Now, of course, the prefect was irate at being tricked in this way. And so he devised a most cruel death for St. Lawrence. He was roasted on a gridiron. The very thought of it makes us shudder. But St. Lawrence not only uh, suffered this death, but seemed unmoved by it. In fact, it, it is re reported in the acts of, the, of his martyrdom that after he was lying on the gridiron for a while, he taunted the, the emperor, the prefect, and said, I'm done on this side, you can turn me over. And that reminds me of what St. Alphonsus says in a wonderful book that he wrote on the martyrs called The Victories of the Martyrs. Fabulous book, which has short biographies of quite a few of the martyrs and, by the way, has a, a wonderful section towards the back on the martyrs of Japan. Fascinating stories. But St. Alphonsus says when you read the martyrs, you wonder how is it that they could have suffered what they did so bravely. Human nature shrinks from even small suffering. And then you read what the martyrs endured. And St. Alphonsus says, God gives them the grace those who are faithful to him in professing their faith. God gave them the grace, and that is how they could endure the martyrdom without giving up their faith, without crying out in agony and so forth. It reminds me of the story of two women martyrs whose feast day is celebrated, I believe, on March the 6th, Saints Perpetua and Felicitas. And one of the two of them was pregnant with child when she was cast into prison. And she delivered the child in prison. And while she was delivering the child, she was crying out from the labor, childbearing. And one of the guards taunted her and said, how are you going to endure it when they throw you to the wild animals if you can't even endure without crying out in pain delivering a child? And she answered back and said, well, right now it is me that is suffering. But when I'm thrown to the lions, Christ will be suffering in me. A good answer. And indeed, that is what we see in the life of St. Lawrence. How on earth could he have seemed so calm and unmoved in the midst of being roasted over the fire to such a point where he taunted the, the pagan emperor commander there? Uh, regarding his martyrdom. So we have always honored in the church the martyrs. And today, as we celebrate the Feast of St. Lawrence, it is an opportunity for us to call to mind these heroes of our faith. 
in the early times, the only saints that were honored were the martyrs. And then after a after period of time, as there was no longer the, uh, the physical bloody persecutions, and there began to be various saints and virgins and holy men and women declared saints who were not martyrs, then they were added also to the list of saints. But even to this day, the official catalog of the saints in the Catholic Church is a book called the Roman Martyrology, even though it contains not just the martyrs. But the martyrs are our heroes, and we can think of them and we should be very proud of having these great heroes who have gone before us. It is said that in the early, and I don't remember which one of the fathers of the church gave this estimation, that there were 11 million martyrs from the time of Christ up until the Edict of, of Constantine in 313, outlawing uh, persecution of, of the Christians. And other spiritual writers believe that is a very conservative estimate of how many men, women, children were put to death for the faith in the early church. And yet the more they were put to death, the more the faith spread. So much so that there was a saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the faith. So we can be very proud of the martyrs and not just in the early centuries, like St. Lawrence, but down through the centuries, there have been many martyrs, even up to our own time, to the point that it makes you wonder whether or not some of us in this room will one day be called upon to lay down our life for our faith, to either deny our faith or lose our life. But we know that the martyrs, according to the teaching of theologians, martyrs go straight to heaven. And there were many holy missionaries and, who prayed and yearned for the grace of martyrdom knowing that they would go straight to heaven without any time at all in purgatory. But it does make us wonder, will I have the strength, if it ever came to that, will I have the strength and the grace to persevere in my faith? And the simple answer to that is yes, we will, if we are living our faith day to day. If we are living our Catholic faith in what is called by spiritual writers a dry martyrdom, then we will have the grace, if it ever came, to a bloody martyrdom, to persevere, to stand up for Christ and his church and for our Catholic faith, even to the point of being put to death for it. So we have to live our faith day in and day out. And so they call that, as I said, a dry martyrdom. It's not the shedding of blood, but it is a real challenge. And it takes courage to fulfill our daily duties, to avoid the occasions of sin, to live our prayer life, to practice virtue day after day. That is a dry martyrdom. One of these virtues that we must practice is the virtue of patience. And I mention this because this is conspicuous in the lives of the martyrs and really all of the saints. And it seems to me that impatience is, you might say, the last bastion of the devil in our souls. Once we eliminate all the other vices and sins, we have a difficult time conquering the annoyance and the irritability that we're all subject to with the little crosses and annoyances that come our way each day. Yesterday, we had the Feast of St. John Marie Vianney. And while there are so many marvelous things we could reflect upon, his 16 hours of the day in the confessional, his extraordinary penance and abstemiousness. One of the things that really sticks out in his life is how he went to this little village in southern France of ours as the pastor when very few people even went to Mass on Sunday, let alone practice their faith. And that over a period of time, he completely changed the lives of all of the parishioners in that village. He even called his cemetery his reliquary because he said, my parishioners are truly saintly people. <coughs> he succeeded in closing down every single last tavern in the city. I believe there were 11 when he came and it wasn't really a city, a little village, little town. There were 11 when he came and he succeeded in closing every one of them down. But the real testament 
to the virtue of the people is a story that I recall in his life. And that was a man who went to ours to visit the village because he heard so much about it. And so he went to ours. And as he was coming into the village, he came by a little brook or creek. And there were a couple men, a couple farmers, uh, leading their, an animal across. And I don't remember if it was a like an ox or a horse, but an animal to pull the plow. Now you can imagine for those poor farmers, their wealth lay in their land and in their animals. This is a quite a wealthy, uh, uh, quite a, uh, an investment, I should say, this animal, this farm animal. But the animal got stuck in crossing the creek, got stuck in the mud. And immediately the two men dropped what they had in their hands and went right to the assistance of this animal and pulled it out and took it to the other side. So this visitor, it might seem like a little thing, but this visitor who came was just amazed because there were no swear words used. There was no expression of anger, impatience, of frustration. They simply got right to work and helped the animal without the least improper word escaping their lips. And he marveled at the patience of these peasants. And that to him was a testament of what St. John Marie Vianney had accomplished in that village by leading these people to such a life of patience. Uh, their neighbors used to make fun of the people of ours and said, you're all monks, like, like you live in a monastery. And their only reply was, well, our pastor is a saint, so we must do what he says. In other words, their neighbors saying, you know, you're overdoing it as far as practicing your faith. But that was their reply. We must obey our pastor because he is holy and we want to go to heaven. So that to me was one of the greatest things he accomplished because in our lives, we know how hard it is to control our emotions, to practice patience, and not just at the big things, but sometimes the little things, the little annoyances, the little contradictions that happen every day. One of the saints best known for his meekness was St. Francis de Sales. He was Bishop of Geneva in the late 1500s at a time when Calvinism had decimated the diocese. And he worked tire tirelessly and reconverted tens of thousands of people who had lost their faith back to the Catholic Church. But even the Protestants marveled at his meekness, his gentleness, his humility, his patience. One Protestant minister said, I think if Christ were to come back into the world, he would be just like the Bishop of Geneva, meaning the Catholic Bishop, meaning St. Francis de Sales. So he, he impressed by his example, even the Protestants. And yet he did not come by that meekness naturally. He himself said that it took years of striving to suppress those feelings of anger, resentment, or impatience, emotion that he had. It didn't just happen, but he worked at it. And he came to such a point that he was meek as a lamb. Anyone who, sometimes he'd walk through the streets and the Protestants would shout abuse at him. But he never was angry. He was always very meek. And again, his example converted many. So when I think of St. Lawrence on the gridiron, I think of an extraordinary conquest of practicing patience and all the virtues, but especially that virtue, one that we all ought all to strive for. Remember, if we're living our faith, striving for virtue every day in the little things, then if it ever comes to the point where we are tested in the big, the big thing, that is of either renouncing our faith or being put to death, then we will have the grace to persevere and to stand up for Christ, for the truth, and to give our lives. And what a blessing that would be, because martyrs go straight to heaven. May St. Lawrence and all the wonderful martyrs of our faith help us to be patient in living the dry martyrdom of every day, that we might one day enjoy the happiness of heaven with them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.